So please give a warm welcome to Anna. Hello, thank you everyone. I just, yeah, as I said, if you can hear me, uh, oh, if you, I was about to say, if you can't hear me, let me know, but you wouldn't be able to hear that, would you? So, <laughs> that wasn't a great strategy on my part. <laughs> Anyways, uh, welcome everyone to my talk, uh, Spark Your Creativity, The Power of Swift Playgrounds 4. Uh, I know some of you in the audience have already seen this talk, maybe multiple times, and I am sorry because I can't make any promises that this time the jokes that I prepared are going to be funny like the last time. Um, however, what I can promise you is plenty of really random quotes, uh, rhetorical questions, maybe a little bit of silliness and shenanigans if I feel up to it. So this is the, this is the premise, <laughs> and let's get started. Uh, first of all, I wanted to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Anna. I am originally from Italy. However, I've lived in the UK now for around 10 years, which is a long time. And I'll tell you what, British food is not that bad, because if it was, I wouldn't have stayed there that long. So, <laughs> Yorkshire puddings are really, really, really good. And we don't have those in Italy, so recommend. <laughs> um, I've been an iOS developer since 2017. And I'm currently working at Spotify. Shout out to my Spotify crew down there. I'm putting them on the spot. They're not going to be happy about that. <laughs> I work there as a mobile infrastructure engineer, and I've been there for around a year and a half, almost. And before becoming a developer and a software engineer, I was a really, really bad scientist. And when I, I say this because I accidentally set fire to a lab bench once, and I do reiterate it was accidental. I didn't do it on purpose. Uh, hopefully nothing's going to catch fire today, although I did have a nightmare that it was. So keep, please keep an eye on the cables. <laughs> Anyways, my goal in this talk is to hopefully encourage you to give uh, Swift Playgrounds a chance to pick it up, uh, either for your Mac or for your iPad. Uh, see if it can help you get over certain things that I think lots of us struggle with, such as perfectionism, unfinished projects, and uh, motivation or lack thereof. And uh, I hope to do so by telling you about some of my experiences, some of my struggles and the things I, I went through and how I overcame some of them. Uh, we're also gonna have a look at what you can and what you cannot do with Swift Playgrounds. I'm gonna give you a bit of a rundown, a bit of an explanation, and um, yeah, some lessons that I learned along the way. And just so you know, I've seen there's lots of QR codes today. There's another one at the end, so. <laughs> If, um, if I mention anything here, like some resources or some articles or anything like that, you will be able to see it at the end when you scan uh, the code. So don't worry, you're not gonna miss anything along the way. All right, let's get started. Let's talk about unfinished business and unfinished side projects. The title of this slide is a tribute to my comfort movie, which is Kill Bill. <laughs> but um, regardless, we all, I think it's a pretty commonly known fact in our industry that unfinished side projects are a thing, right? Everyone's heard of them, maybe experienced this type of thing, and they're a common problem. It's, I think that's a pretty clear, um, clear fact. Why? That's a big question, but I think the simplest answer, the simplest way you can put this is mathematically, side projects are really common, so because there are a lot of side projects, it's certain that not all of them are going to be finished. So it's not mystery why that is a thing in the first place. But if you think about it, it's quite an interesting phenomenon in the first place, how, many, how widespread side projects are in our developer day-to-day -day world, right? I think it's, very, it's actually very rare for a profession to do that, like your job is also your hobby and vice versa. And after work, when you go home in the evening on the couch, you're still doing your job away from your job. And it's quite funny because if you think, someone told me that builders, you know, just people that build houses have the grottiest houses. And <laughs> it's definitely not the case for our industry and our profession. So as I said, it makes sense mathematically why this can be the case with so many side projects started and such a culture around it. Personally, I had countless of unfinished side projects. Um, I had a folder on my Mac that literally looked like that, but even a little bit worse, my project graveyard. And it was just like a bunch of Xcode projects that, it, weirdly, they all had a very similar setup. You know, everything set up as I wanted, maybe a few lines of code, maybe. 
a uh, lot of boilerplate, and then they were all left abandoned to their own demise. And uh, I guess if I'm going to be honest, it's the type of thing that it started to bother me a lot. And it was really, really getting to me because the only side projects that I, didn't, that I, fi I did finish up until a couple years ago was my master's dissertation project. Uh, and the only reason why I did finish that is because if I didn't, I wouldn't have gotten my degree. And that was really expensive and I'm still paying for it. So <laughs> I was kind of forced to finish that. I laugh about it now, however, at the time, it was causing me a lot of feelings of you know, shame, of inadequacy, of even frustration, because of course, I'm the type of person, I always get a million ideas, and to see none of them ever come anywhere close to fruition, it was something I took personally. Maybe not as personally as the bride and kill bill took things, not as violently. <laughs> however, it was something that I wanted to discover and to um, explore. So, as an ex-bad scientist, I decided to set myself to do some bad research. And uh, I made a survey on my Twitter, or we should call it the app formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> and uh, I asked my friends on there, approximately how many of their iOS side projects had they finished? And then I asked them a follow-up question. But I was really shocked. I was part shocked and part relieved to see the results of the survey because I think you can read that 63% of the people that responded to this survey, and it's not a non-negligent number, it was around like 100, and I think at the end it was around 150 people. 63% of people said that they finished between zero to 25% of the side projects that they started. And I honestly, I was certain that people were gonna be more in the you know, 25 to 50 bracket, but it kind of brought me a lot of relief to be like, okay, I'm not the only one. Like, and I wonder out of these people, how many actually had the, z the zero percent like I did. So yeah, it was quite interesting. And then the follow-up question that I asked on this uh, bad science survey was, what does finished even mean? How do you define it? And I found out that of course, everyone has a completely different definition of what is a finished type project. <laughs> For me, my definition of a finished side project is if I build something that looks cute, I put it on my iPhone, I look at it, and I'm like, nice. And that's me finished. And even with this, with this um, criteria, I had 0% completion rate. So <laughs> it wasn't great. <laughs> Some people say that for them a project is finished when they've got it up on test flight, when their friends and family are trying it out, and when they're just using it as something that a few people use. Some people say that an app is finished when they put it on the app store, and some people say when they sell it and they get some nice moolah for it, which, you know, I don't blame them. I also like that. However, regardless of your definition of what a finished side project is, it still seems crazy. Why does the abandonment rate of side projects in our iOS development discipline still seem so high? I looked in the camera, breaking the fourth wall. That was weird. I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> so, <laughs> there is some more. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so <laughs> it's like the office here. <laughs> Through some reflecting, some journaling, and some more bad science, like some mediocre research at best, I went on to find out about the answer to the slide below. That if you missed it, because I had a kind of a giggle intermission, is why does the abandonment rate of side projects still seem so high? And um, animations again. Basically, I concluded that sometimes project abandonment is really often due to just a fall in motivation. And that seems pretty obvious. But through researching and reading into this, I actually came across a really interesting concept, which was called the motivation deadline. Motivation deadline, very simply put, is how long does it take you to just give up on a project and declare yourself as cannot be bothered anymore? For some people, this deadline is months. For some other people, it's weeks. For me, I calculated that it's one week. But not just one week during, you know, during the summer, during you know, normal months. It's one week during the winter break. So I'd, I'm, I'm actually going to assume it's a lot less during normal day-to-day -day work. Um, however, 
as I was researching this and I realized like, okay, I have an extremely, extremely short motivation deadline. That's great. I also came across this quote by Zig Ziglar, which I really love. It makes me laugh quite a bit. And it says, people often say that motivation doesn't last. Well, neither does bathing. That's why we recommend it daily. <laughs> I did promise lots of quotes, so this is one of the first of many. <laughs> Another quote that really stuck with me that I feel is related is by Sarah Blakely. If you don't know who Sarah Blakely is, she's the founder of a billion dollar company called Spanx. I'm actually going to assume that not everyone knows what Spanx is, but basically the reason why every Hollywood actress and actor looks completely snatched on the red carpet is because they're wearing this garment that Sarah Blakely invented. She's an absolute genius, and she was completely self-made, and she said something that, as I said, really stuck with me. She said that ideas are the most vulnerable at their, in their infancy. She was referring more to the fact that sometimes you don't have to immediately tell all your friends and family as soon as you have an idea and you started working on it. You should develop it on your own and make sure that you don't get much outside influence to dissuade you from continuing on your idea. However, I think it kind of applies to this because ideas are fragile at the beginning unless you nurture them and you bring them forward. So how do you get your daily motivation back? How do you protect your ideas when they are at their most vulnerable? You have to get something up and running pretty fast. You have to get to that nice moment quickly so you can nurture your idea and help you progress along with it. And that's what I was getting to. However, it's hard to do that. It's quite hard to do that. If, like me, you may be suffering from a condition called destructive perfectionism. It is not an actual, like, real medical condition. It's just something I made up. And it describes how I've been feeling all this time. So a little bit of background. It's, um, when I first started doing iOS development at university, I was a little bit of a cowboy, a code cowboy, as I called myself, because I was learning the basics of it, of what it was, but they weren't really like putting much detail into it, and especially no details on best practices or things that you should do. And of course, as a university student, you have to cut corners to make your deadlines if you can. And that's how I started with iOS development, like really, really wild stuff. Like I would go around bragging about how big my view controller was. Look how many things I can fit into one file. And this is the type of things that I thought were okay to do. Uh, one time I was really delighted because I, was, I clicked on the memory debugger by accident and I saw a wonderful circle. <laughs> oh my God, that looks like a stereograph, I thought. And I later found out what that was, so that wasn't that nice. But pretty much, I'll just tell you, I was a menace, okay? I was a menace. But somehow, I managed to get a job. And as I progressed in my career, and I started to get some code reviews, and I started to fail some interviews, I realized that, okay, there are such a thing as best practices, and there sometimes the difference between an interview passed and an interview failed, and there's sometimes the difference between a crash and an app that works semi-functionally. So, I was like, okay, so there's, a, there's some standards to follow, that's fine, I can do that. However, I think I took it a little bit too far because by believing there's a best way to do stuff, I confused it and I started to think that there's only one way to do stuff, right? And I think something that really motivated this is also the fear of judgment that I started to develop when I was opening a PR and I got a little bit of pressure, okay, like this PR has to be perfect as soon as I open it, otherwise I'm gonna get comments and I'm gonna get shamed for forgetting to put the colon in the right place, this type of thing. So of course, it was not the ideal scenario for me. However, it had some benefits, of course, because my code improved a lot. It's quite <laughs> <laughs> However, the side effect was that perfectionism really started to bleed into my side projects, into my hobby, the things that I really, really love doing, and I used to do. So, you know, I don't even know how to, what <laughs> movement this is. I, I was really enjoying it. Let's just say I was having fun with it. And uh, the thing is that started to change. It's, I started to take things a little bit more seriously because I started to treat even like a single dev hobby idea project the same that I would treat a multi-dev million user kind of app. And I think that's, that's kind of ridiculous. However, because I really was so stringent into the fact that there's the one way, best way to do things that it naturally bled into this. 
And the thing is, like, the fun and passion that I had for iOS development was still there. However, some of the experimentation and playfulness that I had, especially at the beginning, was, was gone and things were getting, as I said, like, a little bit too serious. I, I'm not going to blame Xcode. <laughs> but I will say <laughs> that I think part of it for me was the fact that I was in the same environment for my hobby project as I was on my professional project. And I think that blurred a lot of lines for me and it caused this type of conclusion and single-mindedness for me. Anyways, what do you get when you mix? Destructive perfectionism and an extremely short motivation deadline. Any guesses? <laughs> well, you're gonna get 100% abandonment rate just like I did. Something that I did fail to understand for a really long time was actually that 100% abandonment rate, 100% abandonment rate, no matter how much it plagues you, no matter how much shame it makes you feel, it's not actually 100% failure rate. This is something that, as I said, I learned much, much later, even after I started doing this talk like a year ago. And it's the fact that sometimes you may have, I don't know, one file, with one new thing that you've tried on a Swift UI view and you still learned something, that's not a failure at all, that's an improvement. However, as I said, it took a while for me to get this. And in the meantime, it was just a, a stirring, brewing pot of shame and guilt and all things like that. <laughs> However, someone came to the rescue. In December 2021, we got Swift Playgrounds 4. Before I get started and explain exactly what it is and everything, I need to make a very important clarification because a lot of people still get it wrong. Even I got it wrong when I initially submitted my talk idea like a year ago for uh, iOS Dev UK. And so it's okay to get it wrong because they have kept it a little bit blurry when it comes to naming and stuff. There's a difference. Swift Playgrounds is not, imagine like a big, Red Cross is not Xcode Playgrounds, okay? The Xcode Playgrounds that you get on Xcode are completely separate to the Swift Playgrounds app, okay? It, as I said, it's a completely standalone app. However, in this app, you can also run Xcode Playgrounds, but I'm gonna show you that later. So, this app has existed for quite a few years, even before December 2021. And the before state, so when we had Swift Playgrounds 3 and below, uh, this app let you create, edit, and run Xcode Playgrounds files, which are files that have a .playground extension, just to remind you. And after Swift Playgrounds 4, you can still run .playground files. However, since Swift, Swift Playgrounds 4, now you can create apps uh, as well on Swift Playgrounds, executable apps in a really paired back and quite, I, I find quite nice ID, which is available both on Mac and on the iPad. So it's not called iPad Playgrounds like I mistakenly thought, it's Swift Playgrounds and it's both on Mac and on the iPad. And I, th I, I saw this is quite funny, when yesterday at Paul's talk, I was like, oh, there's another bird logo here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a weird thing that I didn't notice actually in the latest beta, they've gone and changed the name I've noticed this two days ago. It's not called Swift Playgrounds anymore on the 4.4 beta, it's just called Playgrounds. So it's even more confusing, but I hope, <laughs> I know. I hope I've, I hope I've managed to clarify at least on, at the beginning the difference between the, the things. Another really curious thing is that actually Playground apps are Swift packages under the hood. That was really high pitched. I've put here, a little side-by-side -side comparison of a normal Swift package manifest and a Playground app Swift package manifest. If you cannot see, like, it is on the slide, but it's, it, there's just a couple of very important differences that I wanted to point out. First of all, we have, sorry, <laughs> we have a new import type, which is Apple product types, and from there, there's a new product, a new type of executable the iOS application. Now, if you're thinking, of, oh, maybe I can put that in my Swift package file. No, you can't do that. 
oh, maybe I'm gonna read the documentation for it. No, there's no documentation for it. So <laughs> just, it's there. <laughs> there's nothing to do about it. But that's, I just thought it was funny because I was curious to see how can that happen? How can you make apps from, I guess, Swift Playgrounds? So that's where the magic happens in a way. And another funny thing I've noticed in this different manifest is the little comment at the top, which says, this file is automatically generated. Don't touch it or else. <laughs> However, yes, it is auto-generated. But from what I understood, you can, you can still um, edit it. Just don't trust that your edits will stay there. Because as far as I understand, if you change anything from a Swift Playground setting that affects any of those things, that's when it auto-generates really weird stuff. Anyways, that's, um, that's the thing. Okay, now I wanna talk to you a bit more about Swift Playground Sport, and I wonder if you want the good news first or if you want the bad news first. D don't have to answer because I have decided for you, otherwise I have to, <laughs> <laughs> I have to change the slide order. <laughs> Let's not do that. Let's talk about the bad news first. Let's talk about the limitations of playgrounds. Number one, there is very, very limited debugging. And when I say very limited debugging, it's print statements and a dream. And that's it. And I'm looking around now and I don't see any tears in anyone's eyes. So <laughs> I think maybe that's fine. <laughs> the second one is the, the big one for me personally. And it's with SPM. You can use SPM Swift Package Manager However, you can only, there's two caveats. Number one is that you can only use public packages. You can't use a local package, package. I have tried, it was a disaster. And you can only import Swift dependencies. You cannot use any Objective-C based dependency like Firebase, like Realm, like any of that. If you do, it will let you import it, but it won't let you build with it. It will give you that wonderful warning the target type, CLang target, is not supported. No comment, because I have another talk I'm writing on that. So. <laughs> Shameless plug. So there are some entitlement missings as well. There's a few that you can choose from, but something like CloudKit that I really, really wanted to use in one of the apps I was getting ready for, I couldn't use. So it's not available for you to use. I am actually not sure why that is at all. Uh, and there's also no support for extensions like widgets. <laughs> there's a few more limitations. However, for these ones, I have found some viable workarounds. I think there are some workarounds for the ones at the top too, but I haven't personally tried and tested them, so I didn't want to like, you know, put my name on them. But I'm sure, as everything, you, you can find ways around certain things. However, for these ones, so, they say that you cannot, you cannot use Xcode Cloud in Swift Playgrounds, that makes sense, otherwise it would have called Swift Playground, Swift Playground Cloud. But what you can do is you can add a Playground app to Xcode and use Xcode Cloud that way. The other big uh, limitation is there's no out of the box unit tests and support for other extra targets. One thing you can do is you, sorry, uh, you can use Playground Tester, which is a great Swift package and it works really similar to XC test. However, it doesn't work the same under the hood, obviously, because it has to go around certain things. However, you can use that, and uh, I've used it in the past, and I was quite happy with it. And then source control is obviously not gonna be an issue for you if you're gonna use Swift Playgrounds on your Mac. However, if you do wanna use it on your iPad, you don't have the terminal, the command line, whatever to use Git. So there's, you have to use an app called Working Copy, which I found is not too bad, but you have to pay money for it. So if you're stingy, um, you're out of luck and you have to rename the file version one, version two, real version, best app. <laughs> I, I literally used to do that before I discovered what Git was. So <laughs> anyways, okay, now that we've gone over the bad stuff, um, let's talk about what you can do with Playground 4. And now this is the scariest part of the talk for me because this is the demo I re-recorded a couple days ago and I hope it's playing. Okay, wait, pause. Sorry. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to show you basically what's going on 
in Playground and give you a bit of familiarity with it and maybe explain a couple of cool things like my favorite features of it. So as you open the app, uh, you will see the different projects at the top, the Xcode Playground, different from a Swift Playground app like you can see on the side. And then at the bottom, you are gonna see this thing called more playgrounds. There's something called playground books. And they're basically like walkthroughs that will walk you through how to develop something or how to learn something step by step, which I think is really, really cool. Um, yeah, I was just scrolling along. I could have sped this up. Anyways, um, I wanted to show you now what it's like to run an Xcode playground from Swift Playground. So this is like a really stupid thing I try to do. Like I wanted to write Baby Shark in as least lines as possible. And, um, and the video is not loading. No, the internet is working. Okay, no, it's working now. Um, yeah, the cool thing I think for Xcode Playgrounds is that you can separate them in different pages, which is really handy if you're doing something like advent of code or something. And then you can run, as you can see, you can run things, but you can also step through your code slowly, right? And what does that do? That, I think, is the sickest thing ever. It will do one bit at a time, and it's gonna show you what is currently being executed. And that Xcode doesn't do that. So I think this is a win for Playgrounds, at least in that, uh, in that aspect. And here I wanted to show you how you can create an app, which is very, very simple. Literally one click. And at the center, you're gonna see the code editor. On the side is the preview. And on the other side, you're gonna see the file structures and the app settings. Um, you add a file at the top. Oh, okay, no, I'll talk about that later. Anyways, here's the settings. You can pick an accent color for the app. You can select a pre-made icon and all the capabilities that you may need are also found here, except for CloudKit, as I was saying. <coughs> um, <laughs> and here, this little bit of um, settings, that's what you, need, you use to upload directly to App Store Connect. And it auto bumps as well, which I think is pretty cool. Um, yeah, you can add, here's how you can add Swift packages. I, will, I didn't add an actual Swift package, but that's fine. And uh, here I forgot to show you actually, but there's really, really cool auto-completion. I found it, it worked, like I was really, really surprised and I don't even have like a really good iPad. I have an iPad Air 4 from like 2020 and auto-completion was like amazing, but I forgot to show it here, so you'll have to try yourself. Um, and as I showed earlier, you can see, you can use the Swift library. I did try and um, do what you were saying in your talk and import one of my components, but it didn't work in the Swift Playgrounds library. So I was a bit gutted. Uh, <laughs> but you can also see the documentation here by just clicking on whatever you want to see the documentation for. And uh, yeah, it's got a lot, of, a lot of stuff. And here I was, oh yeah, I wanted to show you how you can basically, on the iPad at least, um, drag some files. You cannot create like a JSON file, for example, from Swift Playgrounds but you can very easily drag that in. And you can also drag in things like asset catalogs, um, different types of resources like images, like fonts. So it's quite nice the way it does that. And, um, and yeah, I think I'm gonna speed up this demo because otherwise it's gonna take ages. No, I have done, I've messed up. Okay, uh, give me a second. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Okay, here I wanted to show you um, a little bit more of an involved app that isn't just like a blank one. Here's something I've been working on and I haven't released. And I really like the fact that you can have different tabs for the files you're working on at the top. Um, I think, of course, you get that in Xcode too, but it's handy that you have it here too. And uh, yeah, the previews work really, really great. As I said, mine is not a great iPad and it completely runs like really unperformant apps like this one with no problems. Um, so yeah, I, I was very surprised when I first found out. And um, yeah, another cool thing with previews is the fact that if you change a different file, you will see the other preview of the file right next to it. So you can switch between the general app preview and the preview of the file that you're currently working on, uh, which also I think is quite sick. And you can resize the previews in a really like nice and seamless way. Don't know why I showed that warning. Um, anyways, yeah, and here's how you just run the app. And when you run it on the Mac, it's actually gonna install the app on your Mac. 
uh, but it's not going to do that on the iPad. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it. That's the demo that I wanted to show you. But then I wanted to give a little bit of a special place to my favorite feature completely, which is this magic. Look, you grab the bracket and it auto indents for you. No, and it loads. <laughs> that was so anticlimactic. There we go. So look how, and it has like a little bounce as well. <laughs> Just so delightful. I'm sorry, I have to give this, like, this feature its entire slide because it <laughs> delights me every time I use it. <laughs> so thank you for putting up with that whole demo. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick summary of the things that you can do with Playgrounds. So you can use both Swift UI and UI Kit. I've used both and absolutely no problem. You can add use Swift packages, although as I said, with the two caveats. Uh, you can view documentation straight from there, drag and drop non-Swift files and other types of resources like JSON, asset catalogs, et cetera, et cetera. And you can upload to App Store Connect directly from Playgrounds, which, as I said, works really, really nice. Uh, and then finally, the previews work like mwah. And if you remember at the start, I said I was Italian, so I can do that culturally, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what I personally think are the best uses of Swift Playgrounds, besides the very obvious like prototyping and playing around that many of us maybe have already done and already started doing, I think that for side projects, it's, or at least the validation of side projects, it's a perfectly capable instrument. And I found like I've had a lot of fun with it doing exactly that. Every single side project I've done in the past year and a half or more than year and a half has been with Swift Playgrounds. And um, I think the best use, of course, it's learning. At one point, they were really marketing Swift Playgrounds for kids to learn iOS development. However, I think that we can... <laughs> Cheers. Um, I think it's beneficial for everyone, not just kids. And in a way, we all have to constantly learn, so it's very beneficial, but most of all, I think the benefit of learning that Swift Playgrounds have is the fact that all of a sudden, the entry barrier into iOS development has gone down from a 2K MacBook to like a $400 iPad. And that's quite, that's not negligent, that's a substantial change. That means a lot, a lot more people that previously wouldn't have afforded to start iOS development <laughs> can now do that. For me, I know that if university didn't give me a MacBook, I wouldn't have ever had the, you know, the money as a broke student to buy my own and to start iOS development. <laughs> so I'm actually really glad about this shift and the opportunity that this can open up for a lot of people everywhere. And yeah, so even with it, all its limitations, I think that Playgrounds has many more uses and has proven itself to be great. However, are limitations really all that bad? Some actual research, like by real scientists, not by me on the internet, S and I did link the study at the end, suggests that limitation can actually stimulate your creativity, and they can therefore be helpful. It is all a balance, however. As you can see from the graph, if you have too many constraints, you have such a thing such as lack of resources, and if you have too few, you have lack of focus, and you're a little bit all over the place. So you have to find, in whatever you're using, the sweet spot kind of in the middle, where is the optimal, optimal balance between focus and freedom and resources that you can use. And I find that Swift Playgrounds really does fall in the middle, and that's why I am so passionate about it. However, there's a really, really good story, which I think is very topical for this city, that I can also use as an example for this. And it's the story of the Köln, did I say that okay? Yeah. Nice, yeah. concert. And so Keith Jarrett uh, was an amazing, amazing, renowned American jazz pianist, one of the best of all time, and a great musician in general. And he was due to perform in 1975 at the Opera House here in Cologne. And he was a very, like, of course, the, an artist of his caliber, he was very, very finicky with the type of instruments that he needed. He had some very, very strict requirements. He needed, like... Uh, I don't know anything about like music theory, by the way, so <laughs> please <laughs> don't listen to every single detail I say, but the, the purpose of it is the general thing I'm trying to say. Anyways, um, 
yeah, he had these like very strict requirements for the biggest grand piano that had to be tuned to perfection, that had to be almost untouched by anyone else. So he arrives here and he sees his instrument and there had been a miscommunication or something in the way and he finds himself with a baby grand piano that as you can tell from the name, is just a small grand piano. And not only it was of course smaller, some of the, ped some of the pedals didn't work the high notes were like a little bit messed up or something. That's a very scientific way of putting it. A little bit messed up or something. And the bass was also not working quite right. So he all of a sudden finds himself with something he's like, how can I play this? This is nothing like something I can use. And he was gonna throw in the towel and just go back and, and give up on the concert. However, the promoter, who I'm sure her skin was on the line. She's like, I have sold a lot of tickets here. We've got a lot of disappointed people in Cologne. You've got to play. So after a lot of convincing, finally she managed to, to convince him. And he's like, right, let's do the best we can to tune this. I'm going to improv and see what happens. So he did. During the concert, he did a complete improvisation. But he played in a way that he normally would have never played because of the way the pedals were, the way that the high notes were, the way that the bass. So he had to basically work in a way that was only possible because of the exact circumstances of that place and time and the instrument that he was presented with. And you might think, what came from that? From that came one of the best-selling jazz piano, jazz piano albums of all time, which you can listen to on Spotify, obviously. <laughs> it is actually a really good album. <laughs> I think this story can all, can all remind us that sometimes from limitations can come some opportunity, some ingenuity, and some new things that we wouldn't have done otherwise. And I personally find that that really is the power of Swift Playgrounds. And I'm, once again, another quote. I'm not gonna go all Oprah, but there's this quote by Dr. Wayne Dyer, and he is the father of modern motivation science or research. And it really resonated with the way that I was feeling and what, what I was going through as I discovered myself using playgrounds. And he says that when you change the way that you look at things, the things you look, the things you look at change. And I think for me, this change in perspective that playgrounds gifted me was really fundamental. It was exactly what I needed to get out of my old way of doing things, to get out of the rut, the automated way that I was setting up things all the time. And look at, the, I look at things in a bit of a different light. And this is basically thanks to the environment that was created by Swift Playgrounds. And yeah, thanks to that, I was finally able to um, finish something and not abandon it halfway through after my motivation deadline expired. I guess Playgrounds and their simplicity really helped me question myself and that's what I was asking. I was like, is there a simpler way that I can achieve the same goal with less faff? And most of the time there really is. So I did spend a lot less time doing some kind of frankly, unnecessary rituals and setup that I used to do all the time. And by doing that, I was able to get something up and running a lot faster, and therefore, I beat my motivation deadline. And I think a lot of the time I realized that I had been, uh, I, I like to say this, like, it's not a real expression, but I hope it gives the idea. I was always cutting an onion with a chainsaw, so, you know, really over-engineering things. And by completely paring back the IDE and changing the usual environment that I was in, I was able to realize that, oh, actually, I have been over-engineering quite a lot. <laughs> and through Playgrounds, I therefore was able to really rediscover um, simplicity and efficiency. And it really encouraged a shift for me from my destructive perfectionism to a more pragmatic prioritization. Uh, it doesn't mean it wasn't fun. It was still really, really fun, uh, but in a much more relaxed and intentional way. And I guess it helped me become more intentional because the way that I was doing things before, almost in automatic, almost the same way, like my work environment is the same as my hobby environment. As I said, it was lacking complete intentionality and I was doing things in automatic, which is the death of creativity and the death of problem solving. And this is kind of what came out of the Swift Playground renowned um, help for me. This is the first app that I ever finished. Uh, no, I finished another one actually. This is the first app I finished since 2018, and it was what I used to learn Swift UI. It's a really silly app, it's just a way that I can use to track my mood because I don't like, you know when they ask you like, how are you feeling today, one or five? That doesn't really work with my brain, so I wanted to do something that was helping me. 
And um, yeah, thanks to Playgrounds and the environment that it created and the fact that I have to uh, really think of new ways of doing things, it really stimulated my brain and it challenged me. And uh, I was able to do it without much friction. So yeah, I was really, really happy with it. Uh, I want to take a quick look also at some other cool stuff that people have done. This, and I'm going to have to play this um, somehow. Um, this is Andy Kwa. He, when Swift Playgrounds first came out, he brought over his Metal, we heard about that, procedural city generation library over to Swift Playgrounds, and he was able to run it in a preview really, really good. Oh no, I, I can never get this to play, because it's an embed. We're going to be here a while. Anyways, <laughs> please, please watch it at the end, because it's really, really cool. Like the, the city's procedural generation works amazing in a preview. And I asked him, I was like, what iPad do you have? And he's like, oh, I've got a 2018 uh, iPad Pro. So that tells you that it's quite powerful when it comes to um, preview performance. And then another thing that I wanted to bring up is this really cool app that was done by Matt Weller at Cephalopods, Cephalo I cannot say that, Cephalopod Studios, which is called Two Dons. And it's basically like a play on the first app that everyone makes, like a to-do app. However, he did a little twist to it, and it wasn't much the content of the app that was important, but more than that, it was the objective. And the objective was to show people that, yes, you can, it's not just, you know, oh, maybe you can build an app and ship it completely from play playgrounds. You can actually do it. And he built this really in public by involving the community, and through doing that, he discovered maybe a few hitches, maybe a few workarounds and things that really encouraged everyone in the community, in this very small Swift Playgrounds community, that, oh, okay, actually, like, this is something that's really doable. It's not completely, like, um, I don't have the word in English here. I only have the word in Italian. Science fiction. There we go. <laughs> it's, not, it's not science fiction that you can ship an app directly from your iPad. It's something that can be done. And that's what encouraged me to start. So he also was interviewed. He got a bit of media coverage from this app, and he was interviewed by 9to5Mac. And he, put, he said something, and he put it so beautifully, so I wanted to share. And he said that, Swift Playgrounds is a great, it's great as a side project engine so far. I say that because there's a sweet spot where constraints enable creativity, like the limitations of a sonnet. I'll be interested to see if any masterpieces emerge, which is very sweet. It's quite nice. So I hope to see some more masterpieces emerge if I've done my job right. <laughs> but now it's time to wrap this up. And I wanted to remind you of a few things. So Playgrounds is not Xcode. It's not the Xcode on iPad that everyone was praying for, but it's still very powerful, and it can help you make some really incredible things. The limitations that it has can actually encourage you to think outside of the box and help you uh, discover new things or do things a way that you've never done them before. And for me, this new dev environment really helped me overcome my struggles, and for the first time in years, I managed to finish some projects. And yeah, I hope you give it a try, and maybe it can help you as well. And before I finish, just wanted to give some special thanks to everyone who really helped me revise and improve this talk. Uh, Matt, uh, Ethan, and Andy for letting me feature their stuff on my presentation. I did ask them. And then I wanted to thank SwiftConf uh, for the talk and for organizing this really wonderful conference, which has been absolutely amazing. And most importantly, thank you all for listening. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Anna. So do we have questions? Give me a second again. <laughs> <laughs> Best photo. Yeah, thank you very much for the great talk. Um, I use uh, Swift Playground, not, I don't think that's Swift Playground for when I'm uh, in my camper van on a camping ground or something, Ooh. and it's really nice. And I uh, encourage to, to use a keyboard and not use the soft keyboard. That's yeah. very important. Yeah, true. Um, and then it makes a lot of fun. Um, but uh, my frustration rate is uh, quite low when using playgrounds, and I have lots more unfinished playgrounds than unfinished Xcode projects. So <laughs> what's the difference for you for having a lot of unfinished Xcode, Xcode projects except the, the, uh, the, the, the colorful icons and playgrounds, which, which is much, fun, much funnier. I think that's a really, it's a really good point. I feel like for me, the colorful icons 
in, it's weird, right? But this is just my personal opinion. Even though I also have some unfinished playgrounds, for sure. For me personally, not as many as unfinished Xcode projects. However, I do approach playgrounds uh, in a really different way than I approach an Xcode project. I feel like I really try and always embrace the playfulness because it is like a playground. So I started to feel, even though I have unfinished playgrounds, I feel not guilty when I have, and I try not to feel guilty because I'm like, it's okay, they're meant to just sometimes test things out. Sometimes they're meant to finish an app from you know start to finish and ship it. Sometimes they're just for me to try, some, to try something new. Um, so I think it's like, for me personally, it's a little bit of a different mentality as well that applies to uh, Xcode versus uh, Swift. But I do, but I just want to clarify, I do like Xcode. Like actually, day to day, my, I work at Spotify, I work on the Xcode project generation team, so I, I'm a fan of both things. But I do really try and think about them for separate purposes and for a separate mentality in a way. So I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. Thanks for a nice talk. Um, you're welcome. I have a question. The, um, say you're you're moving forward with your uh, playground. Uh, you're quite happy wh where you're at, but you are tired of the limitations. Is there an easy way to port that back to an Xcode project? Or? Yeah, you can. Um, just the way that you can use Xcode Cloud. This is a really good mic, by the way. This is really great. Just the same way that you can, um, as, I, as I showed earlier, there was a workaround where you can import, like you can basically use a, a playground app in Xcode. Right. I've never tried this before, so maybe it's something that you can give it a go or I can give it a go, but I don't see why it wouldn't be possible to just use it the same way. At the end of the day, it is a Swift package, and even though you can't, um, like they say that that Swift package manifest is auto-generated, I think it's only Swift playground that auto-generates it. So I think it's fine to use in Xcode, and you can probably do it that way. That's what I would recommend. Yeah. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> so uh, first of all, thanks for the great talk. You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, I have like some uh, questions here that um, you said that we can actually write UI kit code as well in yes. this playground. And how does the previews actually work uh, with UI kit? I found it perfect, no problem. Like, of course, I, I use this like a normal preview, and I put the UI kit code in the in the preview, and I found it performs like quite well. I've not noticed. In fact, sometimes I've noticed it like it works a little bit better than in Xcode. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, something that it's it's definitely doable, and um, a lot of like a lot of frameworks are actually uh, usable. I did make part uh, once again my unfinished playground project. Uh, an AR app on the iPad on Swift Playgrounds, and I was really, really impressed by how well it ran and how like well it performed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it works. And so we don't have any storyboards or something like nah. in, in that. Nah, you've said you've said a dangerous <laughs> word here. <laughs> 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 I do like storyboards though. <laughs> no, but yeah, there's no storyboards, and also a few things that, and I maybe I didn't explain it well, but I'll reiter reiterate now. A few really nice GUI things that you have usually in Xcode, like when you create a core data model, for example, they're not available in Playgrounds. However, all those things are really different types of files under the hood. So you can really, you can, I mean, maybe not with storyboards, but for creating a core data model, there's a way to do it manually. So that isn't always um, a complete block. But I think for storyboard is probably not, uh, probably not enabled. Right, great, thank you. And. Uh like, can we just add um, like the assets and the resource like as easy as uh, we yeah. do in in Xcode? You can just drag them in, like literally. Any, any kind of like assets, like images or fonts or everything. Yes, I've used. Well, so far I've dragged. Um, I I kind of want to show you here, but I also don't want to accidentally show you any company code. But I have dragged over like uh, um, colors asset catalog because I, w I wanted to make a difference. Like I had a very specific thing in my head of like how the colors want to look in dark mode and light mode. So I just, m I made that in Xcode and then I took it from Xcode and like from the Xcode project that I made it in and I just dragged it over to Playgrounds and it worked with absolutely no problem. So mm -hmm. yeah. Great, great. And the last question, sorry. Uh, can we just like install the app in the iPad or I don't know, in our iPhone? <laughs> just <through> this, uh, <laughs> That's playground a good question. <laughs> Um, mm, not out of the box, <laughs> so, <laughs> but y y you can on uh, on the Mac, 
but otherwise, if you want to like use it on your phone, for example, um, that, that's a pretty big limitation. I really should have added this in the slides. Uh, yeah, you have to get it on test flight if you want to see it on your phone, or there's other ways. So you cannot actually install it directly to, I don't know, iPad or not, iPhone? Not directly, not directly. Awesome, thank yeah. you. <laughs> You're welcome. I was going to say no story report on Vision Pro. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> I do have a question, but first of all, a quick comment on the porting your app uh, on the Mac. First yeah. of all, you can open the same project uh, on the Mac, and you can also create a project from Xcode called, um, what is it called? Uh, um, um, app play Playground app. Oh, I didn't know so that. That's yeah, sick. Yeah, so, so I do that all the time. Cool. Uh, and the other thing is because the limitations are the same. That's so you're gonna yeah. you're gonna be an Xcode, but you're gonna have all the problems like you mentioned. And by the way, my frustration is super high in terms of that because yeah. one day or another you reach a point where you realize, oh, I can do, do this on App Playground. Yeah, it's true. And for you, it's creativity. For me, it was like take all the files, create a new Xcode project, <laughs> drag them over there. <laughs> And it works fine. That's the good thing. Yeah. I love though. Before I come to the question, I love the the format, uh, like the fact that it's only an Xcode package. It's only um, the the dot package uh, uh, file and all the things that you would have normally in terrible build settings or info playlist or yeah. whatever. It's all in this single Swift package file. Yeah. Um, but my question to you though is, I I am. I'm under the impression that Apple has given up on this thing because they introduced, they, they talked about it for the first time at WWW two years ago. Yeah. Then it took them six months to give it us that baby. And since that, they just haven't touched it. And this year at WWDC, they haven't spoken about it at all. I and know, when I asked an Apple engineer about that, he said, we cannot comment on future products. So. Oh. I have to say, I don't really know much about what their plans are. I did know that they have put a new beta. Like the one that I showed on the demo is the 4.4 beta that they released a couple months ago, I think. Um, I don't know. I, ho I really hope personally, because as you can tell, I have kind of a preference for this. I hope it's not something that is going to be abandoned. But it is, I don't think they're taking advantage completely of, of it the way that it can be. Um, and he says sometimes, as I said, like marketing more for kids and for like kids learning. Um, so I don't know. I hope my hope is like maybe like this is my dream. OK, maybe everyone is like, oh, cool. Swift playgrounds are really cool. Everyone starts using them and they're like, wow, everyone's using them. And and they don't give up. You would do me a favor. <laughs> <laughs> Just no, to be clear, I, I was as excited as you are. And I'm mm -hmm. still somehow excited. Yeah. Um, and I, I used um, this to teach at kids, actually. Mm -hmm. And nice. I was using it before at Playgrounds came, just when the, the Playgrounds were there, you know, with the dinosaurs or whatever it is. Yeah. And then the apps arrived. And I was like, super awesome. We're going to write apps for the kids. And it turns out there was so many kinds of problems that Apple hasn't think about. Like, you cannot deploy on an MDM in a school. Mm. Oh, um, oh yeah, that's and I've stuff that. like that. And when I tried to find errors to that problem, it seems to me like there is one and a half person working on this at Apple. Yeah, maybe they've. I don't know. I to be honest, it's it's a pity. I haven't observed it too much on my own. Like uh, I guess on my own back, except for seeing that I was I was hoping for WWDC to mention something on it. Um, but maybe so far so good. So we'll have to see and we'll have to hope. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Anna. Please give her thank a big you. round of applause. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thanks.